and wait, I said here, there we are. All right, so there's port scanning tools out there. Um, most of the people just use Nmap because it works so well and it's free. But if you are a Windows shop and you like paying money and getting GUIs, then there are plenty of options available. There's some old ones. Um, if I can never figure out how to get this thing out of the way. All right, come on, okay. So uh, Unicorn Scan was supposed to be very fast. In general, there was a whole generation of these tools that ran only on Windows 2000 because Windows 2000 allowed you to have raw sockets, which means you could send packets one by one out the network port without going through the operating system routines that open a socket. And that would mean it would be possible to send a large flood of packets and watch for the acknowledgments yourself instead of letting the Windows subroutines do it, and that would be better for a port scanner. But they took raw socket support out of Windows XP and later versions, which limited all port scanning tools to the speed of Windows and to the timing parameters of Windows, which slows them down. Um, anyway, Nmap was the main one. This is the first open source one to make network maps by scanning things. It started out command line only and turned into a huge hit like Wireshark. Just a bunch of people love it and contribute to it. And there are plugins and there are special modules you can add that will scan for malware and all sorts of awesome things. It's not as good as a real vulnerability scanner, but it's a very good port scanner. And now it's got a Windows version and a GUI, and it's everywhere. It's in like four or five major movies now. Um, movies used to be laughably terrible about hacking, but in the last three or four years, they pretty much wised up and they hire hackers as consultants. And now they hire lockpicks as consultants, so the lockpicking scenes are better on TVs and movies. Um, and so it's nice to see because it used to be a running joke, what complete idiocy. Like, remember, I think it was um, War Games, they had the computer, and the computer was like, uh, a tube amplifier and a cassette tape player turned around with the cables hanging out of it, and that was the computer or something. Just took any junk that looked like electronics, and then it was back in Lost in Space where he would just cover a wall with tin foil and put lights on it, and that was the computer. You know, so nowadays they do a little better. Um, so Unicorn Scan was a tool to scan really fast uh, in old versions of Windows. It's Linux and Unix only, this one, and it's still around. Um, NetScan Tools Pro is another one. These are old ones. They have GUIs. Now, there are also real vulnerability scanners, and a real vulnerability scanner is also a port scanner, like Nessus. Nessus is a major commercial product, and it has a free version and a uh, education version. It's used by a lot of people. A Nessus scan takes a long time, like an hour, because at first it does a port scan to find the open ports, and then it tests a long list of vulnerabilities. It basically has the CVE list. Well, after it gets a banner that this is some kind of FTP server, it hunts for the attacks that might work against that server and tests them all. And it, it doesn't do the whole CVE list, but it does some large portion of it. So that's why it takes hours. And um, the, it, can, it can flood your network and cause problems. One of my students brought in uh, several years ago in this class, I taught it over the summer, and a student told me, and he contacted me and said, I'm a professional penetration tester. And I want to take your ethical hacking class. And I said, well, this is probably too basic for you. He said, no, what's happening is I run this tool. It prints out this PDF file. I hand it to the client. And they ask me, what does it mean? And I don't know. And they're not happy with that. And I said, well, I was thinking of yelling at him like, you're charging money for that. But on the other hand, he's doing the right thing to fix it, right? Take a class. And I said, well, OK, then come take a class and bring your tool. Let's see it. So he brought in the Accunetrix Hailstorm Scanner, which is an expensive commercial tool. And I asked the network administrator here who is really cool, can we scan the network? And he said, sure, it'll be fine. Because I told him, it won't make any trouble, you won't even notice. Well, I didn't know enough about that tool. It, it floods the network with traffic. And what happened is we had a page where you could subscribe to a mailing list with some really old Unix utility from the 90s that hadn't been updated since like 97. So every, it had like a, 10 fields to fill out and every field had every vulnerability, injection, cross-site scripting and everything. So it filled in that form like 10,000 times. So like 100 strings in each of the 10 fields. And then every one of those sent an email to the administrator informing him of like a corrupt form fill out. So it flooded the email server and it disrupted stuff. And it went on for like 12 hours, and then the network staff, see the guy in charge of the network, Tim, he approved it, but he didn't tell anybody in the staff. He said, I'm gonna test my staff and see if they notice. Well, they noticed, and they tracked down the source IP to be the hacking lab, so they disconnected the whole hacking lab from the internet. And I came in the next day and I said, man, you know, it occurs to me, I wish I'd gotten that permission in writing. Um, <laughs> but he didn't forget, thank God, or deny it, so I'm still here. It's one of those, this could be a career limiting move. Anyway, so, uh, but then we learned something. 
Anyway, and all it found was that one problem, and it reported 100 red level vulnerabilities. And that was when I learned more about these commercial scanners. They will freak out over everything they don't understand, and you have to look. There was one bad page, and it called it 100 vulns. So you can't trust what a scanner produces. The scanner is good in that it really will try every link and try every attack, which you probably won't, but you can't trust what it says. If it says there's a huge problem, you have to go manually test it yourself to decide if it's really a problem or not. Because if the scanner gets some response that isn't just what it expects, it'll freak out. And it might very well be a harmless idiosyncrasy. So you do have to know how to do it manually. And that's how we've done our, our security audits at the City College Network, primarily manually. Anyway, so Nessus will run, um, there used to be a server client, I think it are, now it's all combined in one tool. But it runs, it just tries a whole lot of tests and it can run against any operating system, Solaris or Windows or Unix or anything you want. Um, and it'll, first it'll find the open ports and then it will find the vulnerabilities on those ports and report them. Here's one of the older versions of Nessus reporting a, uh, uh, the, how you can send a SYN and FIN at the same time. This is one of those goofy packets that might go through a firewall <coughs> with a strange combination and they say it would be wiser to just discard packets that have some senseless combination of flags that isn't important. Um, and I mentioned there's ping sweeps where you just ping a whole range of IP addresses to find something. Um, now, the problem is, of course, the firewalls might block the replies, and the Windows default firewall blocks the replies, so this is a lot less useful than it used to be. But there are various tools out there designed to let you do this kind of scanning faster. FPing is one of them, a command line tool that will have many options to send different kinds of ping sweeps. And there's another one called HPing, which will do it um, with many of these options. And I never got very good at using these tools because I found an IP version 6 attack that brought down Windows machines and I contacted Microsoft and one of their, their security engines, I got a rapid response from them. Within three days, the security team said, yes, we know about it, we don't care, we're not going to fix it at all. And I said, oh really? Then I don't need to keep it secret. And so I started doing it at conferences and giving it to students for homework and everything. And after about three years, I ended up at DEF CON and brought down their latest version of Windows 2012. It was a blue screen of death in 10 seconds with it. And after that, they patched it. They said, all right, <laughs> there's some degree of humiliation, which we've had enough. <laughs> and anyway, um, so I, the main point, one of the Microsoft security people told me is you got to check out Scapy. And after you learn Scapy, you don't need goofy tools like this. And that's what you're going to be doing in this class. You're going to be uh, using Scapy. With Scapy is a Python library. And it is so easy to use, you can just make any kind of packet you want with just a few lines of code. So you don't need to be limited by some guy's 100 option in these tools. You can just make whatever you want to make. So anyway, we'll get to it in a few minutes. But here's a broad, there's two kinds of broadcast addresses. And we might as well look at the City College Network, for example. If I get a uh, terminal window, there it is. All right. Um, and I do ifconfig en0. OK, here's the City College Network. Um, my IP address is 147.144.203.247. And here's the network mask in hexadecimal. And this is, if you are a Windows type person, you want to see it that way. This is 255.255.240. We have, if it was 255.255.255.0 with another F here, that would be a class C with 256 possible addresses, minus two. But that wouldn't be enough for all the students on campus. So we have supernetted it by four bits to make a network with 4,000 possible addresses. That's what we're using. Uh, it's halfway between a class C and a class B. And that means that even though my address is 147.144.203.247, the broadcast address is there, 147.144.207.255. That's the highest address in the range, which is always the broadcast address. And anyway, the point is the broadcast, this is what's called the directed broadcast. This has the network portion of your IP address. So that it could be in principle sent from off campus and it would be routed to you. And then at the end, the host portion is all ones, which means every device should receive it. So if you send a ping to that address, it could travel over the internet and then hit many machines here and get many replies. And that's the Smurf attack that we talked about. And because of that, these are no longer permitted to travel over the internet. Internet routers will discard them. But there's a second kind of broadcast, which is the layer two broadcast on your own network. And that uses the generic undirected broadcast address, which is 255, 255, 255, 255. That just means everybody that can hear me. And look at all those answers. And what this is telling me is those are all the Macs on campus. Windows machines are ignoring me. And as you those are all the Macs in range. And what it's telling me, which is interesting, and this changes every semester or two, we have Meraki devices from Cisco. 
There are about 300 of them all over campus, and I'm sure they have isolation mode. We just didn't have it turned on. And a couple semesters ago, I demonstrated this, and then they turned on isolation mode. Now it seems to be off again. You know, it's, it's, we're like beta testing them, and things are changing. In Starbucks, they have isolation mode. If you do this there, you will find only two devices, you and the router. Everybody's in their own separate virtual network, which is a little bit safer. On campus, we're set up the cheap, sleazy way. So is San Francisco Airport, by the way, although I highly recommend against probing their network because <laughs> the TSA agents have got no sense of humor at all. <laughs> and if you're sending anything weird on the network, they are not going to be nice about telling you to knock it off or trying to find out what you were trying to do. But anyway, um, they also just have a big flat network where you can see everybody. Anyway, um, all right. So that's the game. Uh, so that was the Smurf attack. The Smurf attack was when you'd send a directed broadcast, which would go over the internet, so you could be in another city and you could send traffic to the city college pings to the city college broadcast address, and then thousands of replies would go to your victim because you lie about the from address. This is why TCP is so good. You can't lie about your from address in TCP because you have to send a SYN, and then you have to get the SYN ACK. So if you lie about the from address, the SYN ACK will go somewhere else and you'll never get it. You can't make a connection. That's one of the many security advantages of TCP. You can't lie about who you are. But for UDP or ping, you can totally lie about what you are. You can put anything you want in the from address, and that's where the reply will go. But if you don't care about getting the reply, that's fine. So you put your target in the from address, you send pings to a broadcast network, and this guy gets hit with a whole bunch of replies, like a thousand times more than what you sent. It's a bandwidth amplification attack. There are quite a few protocols used for those. The most popular protocol used for it now is DNS. Ping hardly works anymore because they stopped forwarding um, directed broadcasts over the internet. But uh, DNS is the current biggest one. NTP has the largest multiplication factor, uh, network time protocol used to synchronize clocks, but it has pretty much, they've all been fixed because there were a, a couple of years ago there were a ton of NTP amplification floods until everybody pretty much got humiliated if they were running an open NTP server without defending against this. Anyway, um, yeah. No, NTP, you send a request and you get a reply. And unfortunately, NTP is UDP based, there's no handshake, and you can send a request to see the cache of all the recent replies. You can ask it, tell me the IP addresses of the last 600 machines that synchronized on the time server. That's like a special query, and it was on by default in early versions of the NTP software. There's no legitimate reason for anyone to use that, but it happened to be on, and the result it was a small request with a big answer, 100 times bigger. So if you had a one gigabit per second internet connection, you could hit somebody with 100 gigabits per second of traffic by bouncing off somebody's NTP server. It was an, another, there's a whole series of these packet amplification attacks, but the main one is DNS these days. SNMP also has the ability to amplify packets under some conditions. So that's the broadcast ping at CCSF was still working. It was working in 2014 and still working today. Um, all right. But if you want to craft packets, there are tools like HPing and FPing that will give you more options than Nmap will to just, just, just specify all the flags in your packet to make any combination you want. But the cool thing is just write your own scripts. Now you can write shell scripts to do things. Um, there are MS-DOS shell scripts where the original Windows ones where you just type in commands that you would have typed at the command line. And you can do the same thing in Unix with bash shell scripting where you just put in what you would have typed in for commands. Um, so you can make, a, here's a simple shell script that'll run in a shell, and it's just gonna um, actually do a loop while count is less than 253, ping this IP address, ending in that. So this will do a whole series of them, and you've got some projects where you set up some simple uh, scripts here, but what's a lot more fun is use Scapy. And let me just point out the Scapy projects. I put quite a few of them there because Scapy is really great. And um, it's so easy that you can do quite a few things, even if you've never done programming before. Scapy, Python in general, is so easy that you hardly need to know any programming. Um, it's back when I started, there was a language called BASIC, and it was so easy that nobody really had to tell you how to do it. Just print, go to 10, 4i equals 1 to 10, next i. It, was, it only took five minutes to learn <laughs> enough to do stuff. And Python is almost that cool. So here's Scapy. It's built into Linux, built into Kali. You run Scapy. And now what happens is um, it, it always gives you some error messages. You get used to this in Linux. Everything whines. There's some part of it that's broken, but you never care. Um, use the part that isn't broken. And now you have a triple greater than prompt. This is an interactive Python prompt. You can now execute commands one by one right here, like you would in the DOS shell. 
And so you can create an IP object. It knows all the network protocols. So you, it has, you, you can create an IP object this way, and then you can display the properties of the IP object. And you will see that it has a source and destination IP address, and it has all the other header fields that you don't really care about here, like TTL and stuff. It fills them in with reasonable values. And by default, it sets the source and destination to the loopback address. So then, you decide you want to go someplace else, so choose the destination of your target, the other machine you're pinging, and fill it in. And when you put in a destination on the 192 network, it automatically fills in the source for whatever the, right on here, I used 172 in my example here, but it fills it in for you, which is very nice. So then, now, so you made an IP, that's a layer three object. Now I'm gonna make an ICMP object, which is layer seven. So I create an ICMP object, and by default, it's an echo request. And so now, if you want to send something, you send layer three slash layer seven. You build the packet layer by layer. You can even define layer two if you want to, but if you don't define it, it will fill it in automatically for you. And so this will now send a ping. It'll send a packet, and send SR1 is send and receive one. It'll send a packet and wait for the answer, and here's the answer, in comes a ping. Uh, this is, it received one answer, and the packet it got was protocol ICMP, and it's a type echo reply. Pings have some data in them. Not very much, but they have to have some data because otherwise they'd be so short, they'd be too short to send over Ethernet networks. Ethernet networks have a minimum packet size, a minimum frame size of I think 64 bytes. So they have to pad it, and if you don't tell it anything else, it'll just pad it with zeros, which is what's here. This is the load. Um, so you can now send data in a ping packet. You can send IP, and a higher layer ICMP, and the data, your name. And I, when ICMP replies, it replies back echoing the data you put in there in case you want to label your pings and know them apart. So you'll see your name come back, raw load equals your name. So that's ICMP, which is the simplest protocol. The next simplest is UDP, because again, there's no handshake. So if you have a Windows machine with Nmap installed, then you have NCAT, which is a clone of the Linux command netcat, which is very nice. It's a great command that is for some reason missing on Windows, and this is the easiest way to get it on there, install Nmap. And this command will start a listener on UDP. So now it's listening on port 4444 for data to come in. And if it comes in, it'll just print it on the screen. So that's on your Windows machine. There's your target. So now you can send with Netcat. Um, uh, oh, that's if you're using Linux as the target. So if you're listening, you'll be listening here. And if you run Netstat, you'll see that I'm now listening on port UDP 53, 53. Uh, 44, here's 44, UDP 4444. So it's listening on all addresses. 0000 is the arbitrary IP version 4 address. It's listening on 4444, and there it is. And now you can send a UDP packet from Scapy. You make a UDP packet. You specify the port. You'll see the, uh, the source port will default, will default to port 53, which it calls domain through DNS. Um, but the destination port I've set, you have an IP packet already prepared that went to your target before for ICMP, so you can send IU your name. And that will send IP in layer three, UDP at layer four, and your name in the data. And you'll see it appear on the other machine here. This is the listener, and anything that comes in, it listens. So you can make a little sleazy UDP-based chat client this way, and chat back and forth with text chat. It's the simplest kind of networking. So that's the start, and then you do a TCP handshake by hand, which this one frustrates students a lot. They complain about <coughs> So you'll be some suffering involved, but that's how you learn. Um, so this one here, first you find out, if you just make a connection, you can watch it time out and see that it doesn't last very long. One thing that really frustrated me is Linux allows direct sockets. You can snake packets, but it doesn't really allow them without a fight. It, if you start sending out SYN packets from your program directly, see what the operating system wants you to do is never do that. You should call the routine called open a connection to a URL or something, and it will do the handshake with the operating system doing it its own way. It doesn't want you doing it. It has an automatic system to do it. But if you choose to just send packets out the network interface, it'll let them go, but some part of the operating system notices, wait, what's that SYN doing? I didn't send that, and it sends a reset to break the connection. This drove me nuts. Like the first two days I was trying to do this project and nothing would work. And then I turned on Wireshark, there's all these resets flying around. I said, where are they coming from? And so you have to use the firewall to block the resets. That's, so this is just kind of dumb, but this is IP tables. IP tables is a fantastically powerful firewall, but it's sort of clumsy to use. So it takes a kind of long command to do it. But now it'll quit, the firewall will block the resets that are being made by the operating system to try to stop you from doing this. And now you can send raw packets out without anything bad happening. 
You can make an IP packet. You can put a TCP packet on it. You can give it a flag of SYN. And now I can start opening a connection. So I can send this, send receive one IT. It will send the SYN. And what it'll get in reply is a SYN ACK. Here's the port. There's the desk. Here is the sequence and acknowledgement numbers. And here's the flags. Flags equals SYN ACK. So I send a SYN. The server gives me SYN ACK. And it has these numbers, sequence and acknowledgement. This, my original packet had sequence and acknowledgement of zero or one by default. So now the acknowledgement is one. Here's the sequence. I need to add one to this number and send it back. That's what happens. You send a SYN with a, a SYN number of one. The acknowledgement is two. So you have to find this number, the sequence number, and add one to it. So like I say, you'll, you, here you can observe that the timeout is too short and lengthen the timeout. But the point is, now you need to find the sequence number and the ACK number, and you have to add one to the ACK number and the sequence number. And you'll see that here. Like you leave the sequence number alone, and you add one to the ACK number. This is the sequence number plus one. That's the ACK number that came to you. And you have to try a few times to get it right. When you succeed in sending the correct packet back, you'll get an established connection here. That's what your goal is. And I always have a lot of frustrated students in the lab. The first thing, however, I'll try to get you over. The first thing that frustrates them is they don't know how to get two Linux machines. You have to take your 7-zip file and re-extract it into a different folder. So you have two copies of Kali Linux. Or use two physical machines in the lab. But anyway, um, that way you really understand a TCP handshake. And if you do, there's a couple of fun extra credit ones, too, to try. Um, this one here, uh, you've got the, um, here's, here, this one's not even extra credit. This one's fun. So now that you know how to make a handshake, you can use the other kind of scripting where instead of typing in commands one by one, you put them in a script. And if you add a few more lines, you can make a honeypot. This is a very simple honeypot. What this thing does is, um, after you play around with the handshakes a bit to see how it goes, um, here's the entire code for this honeypot. All this does is it sniffs to find a packet. And when it finds a packet, it calls this function find sin. This looks to get the flags and see if it's a SYN. If it receives a SYN packet, it will do something. If it gets any other kind of packet, it will ignore it. If it gets a SYN packet, it just sends the SYN ACK. Changes the flag to SYN ACK, change, switch, flips the destination and source to send a reply, and it adds one to the sequence number and puts it in the acknowledgement number, just what you did by hand. So this will answer every SYN with a SYN ACK. And what that means is, if you run this, and then you scan that machine with Nmap, it will just have thousands of connections and it'll never, never stop. It will see 65,000 open ports. And in principle, your real server could be hiding on any one of them and you never find it. And the scan will tend to take a long time and everything. So it's uh, kind of good fun. Anyway, that's a simple honeypot. And I think there's another one in here too. Yeah, you can do ARP spoofing with Scapy and the slow lower stack. A bunch of cool things you can do with Scapy. Um, they were just custom make your own packets. And it's a very good skill to have. Um, and if you take 124, the advanced ethical hacking class, we make a lot of our own tools in Python. Because you can do everything in Python. It's so easy. You can make your own brute forcers to break into login screens and all sorts of good stuff. Um, and that's very helpful if you want to do the CTFs, because the whole point of the capture the flag competition is you will get some puzzle that is not easy to solve with a standard tool. That's the whole point of them. You have to figure out how to customize things to get in. And knowing how to write some scripts in a language like Python is essential. because they will almost never give you a puzzle you can solve with just a standard off-the-shelf tool. That would be too easy. Anyway, uh, so that's this book is where I started it all. This book called Violent Python I used for 124. It was just doing hacking with Python. Sleazy Python where you don't worry about writing good code. You just write code that will break into things, which is fun. Attack is much easier than defense. That's the secret which education institutions don't get along with. But it, I observed in the real world. In the real world, you have like professionals at corporations and the CIA and everything, and they can't keep the 10-year-olds and 12-year-olds from hacking them from everywhere. So attack is easy and fun. Defense is burdensome and difficult. So it really doesn't make sense to start with defense. You should start people with attack. And then you graduate to defense after you've done hack for a while. That's the way it really happens in the real world. <laughs> anyway, um, and so there's also this Pentester Academy is kind of fun. I'm trying to get this guy to be a teacher here. We might be able to get him in about a year. But uh, this is uh, Vivek Ramachandran. He does great online courses. And um, he has a free ones every now and then. Uh, he's very cute. He has these cute little videos. And then these puzzles you have to solve. And people compete to be the first one to solve the puzzle. Um, yeah, what do you get? You um, I don't know if you get prizes. You might get like free 
free lessons. Lessons cost money, like $200 a month. Maybe you get some kind of lesson. But you get the eternal glory of winning, you know, just like CTFs. Not, Most you don't get a coupon. I don't know. I never paid to get in. But, but anyway, hopefully we'll have him here pretty soon to give those some of the lessons to us. Anyway, so um, I got more of these to do. Let me see if I get this thing out of the way. All right. So which tool uses many plugins and gives you a comprehensive vulnerability report? Clickers. All right. But we are hiring for full-time and part-time positions. So if you or anybody you know wants to teach here, get on the list. We should have as many people trying as possible. Let the best teacher win. Um, so that is Nessus. Nmap is, many people say Nmap is a vulnerability scanner, but it's not. All it does is tell you if the port is open. And sometimes it'll fetch the banner and tell you what it claims to be, but Nessus does much more. It goes to a whole list of vulnerabilities and tells you if they're there or not. It's much more than a port scanner. All right. Um, which tool gives you the most freedom to customize your scan? at 30. All right, and that's of course scripting. If you write your own tool, it can do anything. If you use any other tool, you're restricted to whatever the tool's author gives you for choices. All right. All right, which one of these sends traffic to a broadcast address? like I can quit at 25. The answers are pretty much in. You can change it. You can change it until the clock stops. And then the last one counts. Yeah. All right. That's it. So um, that's the Smurf attack. People remember it. You send traffic to a broadcast address in order to amplify your bandwidth. All right. And so the Yes Man Honeypot returns a sin act for every sin. So what state will Nmap find those ports in? All right, I'll quit at 25. Mm -hmm. All right, they will all be open because they reply with Synac. There you go. Good. All right. So let me see who got the most right, which may be a little clumsy. I'll stop the recording first because that's not terribly exciting. Um, 123, Chapter 5B. All right.